Apparent weightlessness. How many of you have been on the uh, Vomit Comet? I have not. Someday I would like to do that. <clears throat> but a friend of mine, Emily Cal Calandrelli, has done it. And I've got a picture of her uh, in the Vomit Comet. Define apparent weightlessness is the only concept in here. First, a few examples. Harking back to <clears throat> the slide we showed uh, of Newton's uh, Principia, how fast would you have to throw a ball to put it into circular near-Earth orbit? Great question. And some of you 90 mile an hour or 100 mile an hour fastballers out there, I'm going to ask the question if you can put that ball into orbit. And if so, how hard you'd have to train in order to get it up uh, into orbit. Well, we can do this problem now. We know how to do it. Let's take x, the x direction, toward the center of the circle. Here's, here's the ball that you're throwing. Here's its current location. And let's take, let's look at the x direction at the instant that that ball is released from the hand of the th my person throwing it. And let's imagine it being in uniform circular motion, a radius equal to or maybe just slightly greater than the radius of the Earth. Well, we look at the forces in the same way as usual. What are the forces on this object once, it, once it's released by the thrower's hand? Well, there's gravity acting down on that ball. And are there any other forces? Well, there might be some air drag, but let's ignore that for now. Let's just say we've got a perfect vacuum. There's not going to be any air to slow it down. So now, if this is the x direction, then what is the direction of the mg vector, the weight? Well, x is down toward the center, mg is down toward the center, so the x component of the weight is going to be positive. And you're saying, well, wait a minute here. I thought uh, it's pointing in the negative direction. Well. It's not the negative direction. I'm taking this to be the positive x direction. Even though it's down the page, it's still the positive direction. So I replace for the, uh, the force toward the center. This is the centripetal force, the force that causes the object to accelerate toward the center of the circle. And then the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. We can cancel the m's, solve for g. Um, and then solve for v by multiplying both sides of this equation by r, canceling the r's, taking the square root. This gives the speed of the, of the object in orbit around the Earth. It doesn't depend on the mass. The mass is canceled out early on in this calculation. So it doesn't matter if you throw in a, uh, a baseball or a softball or any other thing as long as there's no air drag. Objects of all different masses will orbit at the same rate. And actually, you know that already, because when you're sitting in the, in the space shuttle, you can have a pen. There, you can have a little glob of water. They have different masses. Your body has a different mass from either of those two. And they're all just orbiting along at the same rate. They're going at the same rate. It's independent of the mass. And the, the body of the space shuttle itself uh, is much more massive than you are, and it's just orbiting at exactly the same speed. So all objects, regardless of mass, are going to orbit, as long as the orbital radius is the same, they'll orbit at the same speed. So, and what is that speed? Well, it's easy to work out. G is 9.8 near the surface of the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. The radius of the Earth is about 6 million meters, about 6,400 kilometers. Plug the numbers in, you get 7,900 meters per second. If you um, Convert that to miles per hour, you get 18,000 miles per hour, which is a pretty fast uh, fastball. Uh, so some of you uh, baseball players are going to have to train a little bit to get up to that. Um, the period is such a cool calculation. I love this calculation. Now, what's the period of the motion? Well, it's the time required for one complete revolution around the world. At 18,000 miles an hour, how long will it take to get around the world? Short answer is 85 minutes, just a little over an hour. Uh, and how do we get that answer? 2 pi r, the radius again of the, of the Earth, uh, divided by the speed 
in meters per second, 7,900 meters per second. Plug the numbers in, you get 5,100 seconds. Uh, divide by 60 seconds per minute and you get 85 minutes. It takes about, for the space shuttle it's a little further out, the radius is a little greater, G is a little less, um, takes about 90, 95 minutes for, for the uh, space shuttle to orbit the Earth. Let's actually find the orbital speed of the Hubble Space tel uh, Telescope. Find the acceleration of gravity, the speed, the period of the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits at a height of 598 kilometers above the Earth's surface. So now we've got the Earth's radius, which is 6.4, actually 6.38 if you want to get a little um, more significant figures. Radius of the Earth plus the elevation of the space of the uh, Hubble Telescope gives a little bit larger, about 7 million meters for that radius. If we want to find G, um, we're going to plug in capital G, like we did from chapter 4. Mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to 24 um, kilograms, divided by not the radius of the Earth, but the radius of the orbit between the center of the Earth and the Hubble Space Telescope. That distance is what we want a little bit greater than the radius of the Earth, gives a G value of 8.19 meters per second squared. You say, well, that's not all that different from 9.8. It's just, you know, one number less. Instead of 9, there's an 8. So there's still a lot of gravity out there at the uh, location of the Hubble Space Telescope. There's even more gravity where the space shuttle is. It's, it's at a lower orbit. It's about 8.5, as I remember, 8.5 meters per second squared. And you might be saying, well, just a minute here. I thought you were weightless out there, and you're trying to tell me that you actually have an acceleration of gravity out there. And we're going to cover that in just a minute here and resolve that discrepancy. But you, you feel plenty of gravity out there at the space shuttle. The, what the short answer is, what you don't feel is anything stopping gravity from accelerating you. Here you feel plenty of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared times the, your mass is the weight that pulls you down, but you've got the floor holding you up. What you don't have in the space shuttle is anything holding you up. So uh, the speed, just from the last problem, is the square root of gr, and we went through that calculation, and we can now put in this, uh, the value of g, the lower value of g, the, the, the Hubble telescope experiences times the larger radius to get um, the speed of the Hubble Space Telescope about, uh, in a period of about 97 minutes. Same calculation, really. Uh, geostationary satellites. This is basically the same calculation again. Um, So a geostationary satellite, that's one that doesn't have a period of 85 minutes, which is what you'd get if you're throwing a baseball hard enough at 18,000 miles per hour off a, um, off a mountain. And it's not the 97 or whatever it turned out to be for the Hubble Space Telescope, 97 minutes. We want a period that's 24 hours. Why do we want that? Uh, your television antennas and many other communications devices are placed in orbit above the, if this is the Earth, well, it's, here's a diagram right here. This is the Earth's equator. There's just a whole bunch of satellites at a particular distance away from, uh, directly above the Earth equator, Earth's equator, uh, scattered along this circle that's above the Earth's equator. And at a high enough distance from the Earth, so that the orbital period is 24 hours. Why is that useful? Well, the answer is that you can point your radar dish, well, I guess it'd be pointed this way, trying to look out here, you can just point it and leave it because the Earth's gonna turn every 24 hours along with your radar dish and this uh, satellite is going to also turn around the Earth every 24 hours, so the satellite dish stays pointed at the geosynchronous satellite or geostationary satellite. So now we want to specify the period. It's 24 hours. Let's convert that to seconds. 
Uh, v is the square root of gr, which is 2 pi r over t. That's how we remember v, the speed, is the distance divided by the time. And then, but it's also equal to the square root of gr from the previous calculation. Then we get into some exciting math. We square both sides of this equation. We divide through by r. That r gets killed. One of these r's gets killed. We solve for g. And, and then, actually, let's see. We're looking for r cubed. Um, so this is the, this is the same equation we had for g, actually. Oh, yeah, here it is. So uh, this equation, this equation here gives this equation here. But we also know from the previous example that it equals this um, g m e over r squared. Did, did that previously. And now we're going to solve this for r. And you can do work through the algebra if you want. Basically, you've got to multiply both sides by r squared, divide both sides by the extra junk here to find r cubed, r, which is the cube root of this mess here. Bottom line is that uh, this radius of the geosynchronous uh, satellite is uh, 4.23 times 10 to the 7 meters. It's about, as I remember, about one-seventh the way to the moon. So here's some calculations drawn roughly to scale. The space station has a G of about, instead of 9.8, about 8.8. .8. I think I estimated it before it would be 8.5, but it's 8.8 .8 where the space station is. Um, GPS systems are at about 20,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and they have a G of 0.56. And then geostationary are about 36 thousand kilometers above the uh, surface of the, uh, from the center of the Earth, and uh, their G value is 0.22. Define apparent weightlessness. So this is the, this goes back to the idea of you being on that space shuttle and feeling weightless on that space shuttle even though you're experiencing gravity. And how do you know that you're experiencing gravity on the space shuttle? It's because you're accelerating. You, as you're just, you look around to everybody else there, it looks like they're not moving, but you're actually accelerating. You, the space shuttle, and everybody on it are accelerating toward the center of the Earth. Were it not so, what would happen to you? Where would you end up? If you weren't accelerating toward the center of the Earth, then you just fly off into space. So you know you're accelerating because you're moving in a circle. And you can't move in a circle without accelerating. So um, an object has an apparent weight of zero when it is in free fall. That is when the only force acting on it is gravity. So here's the ironic thing. So if you're on a, um, an elevator and the rope holding up the elevator snaps, then that's a big bad situation. Uh, your apparent weight, remember we defined the apparent weight in the previous chapter, yeah, it was in chapter four. Uh, we defined it to be the normal force acting on you. Well, as soon as you snap that cable, you and the scale that you're standing on and the elevator and everybody in it are, are accelerating toward the, uh, toward the Earth. And you're reading on that scale of zero because you're not pushing down on it at all and it's not pushing up on you. <laughs> There's nothing holding you from accelerating toward the center of the Earth. That's exactly the same thing that happens on the shuttle, on the space shuttle or the space station, anything that's in orbit around the Earth. You're going to stand on that scale, if you fix the scale to the bottom of the, of the thing, and you're not going to measure any apparent weight. The normal force will be zero. That scale reading will be zero. Uh, and the reason is that the only force acting on you is gravity. Well, that's ironic because we call it weightless. Um, but And weightless should mean that there isn't any weight, but gravity 
the force of gravity is called your weight. And so the ironic thing is that when, you're, when you have an apparent weight of zero, you're apparently weightless, it is a fact that the only force acting on you is gravity. I had an argument with a National Public Radio uh, reporter on this subject. And she, at the end of several minutes talking about it, she still didn't believe me. She said, no, the gravity is zero up there. And I said, no, gravity is not zero. If it were zero, then you would fly off into space and you wouldn't stay in orbit around the Earth. So apparent weightlessness does not mean that you have no weight. Weight is the force of gravity acting on you from chapter 4. What apparent weightlessness means is that you and everything around you are in free fall. So this is Emily Calandrelli, my student at West Virginia, and her time in the, in the vomit comet. You can see her hair coming out. I think she's twirling a little bit, and that's why her hair is, is, is uh, flying out. But on the so-called vomit comet, it's a, it's a big jetliner that starts at a reasonable altitude, accelerates upward, and then uh, at this point, the, the nose is, is angling up at 45 degrees, and then they basically cut the engines, um, and it glides, just drifts over the top of a parabola in such a way that the, the plane and everybody in it are in free fall. So then there's no apparent weight, but as soon as you'll feel your you'll feel your uh, apparent weight here, you'll be pushing down against, it's accelerating upward, it's like the, the elevator that's accelerating upward, and you feel yourself pressed to the floor of the elevator, you'll feel yourself have a lot of apparent weight here, none up here, and then back down here, it's gonna be slowing down and pressing you against uh, the floor of the plane again. Artificial gravity, last slide. What period of rotation of a space station produces a normal force on the feet of an astronaut that equals his weight on Earth? So this is the idea of artificial gravity, and you see this in a lot of um, science fiction um, films, as well as in uh, the International Space Station has, has um, artificial gravity like this. It, your bone structure gets, gets weak, your muscles get weak, if you uh, don't have that force of gravity acting on you, and you can simulate that using this uh, uh, artificial gravity. How to do it? Um, you're out in deep space. Let's pretend there are no other planets or anything exerting a force on you, but you want to get, you want to simulate gravity. And so what you do is you spin this cylinder, and then what provides the centripetal force is exactly what what supplies the centripetal force in the case of the rotor in the amusement park ride. It's the normal force that's going to push you toward the center of the circle and your acceleration will also be toward the center of the circle. So let's take X toward the center of the circle as usual and look at forces. The uh, centripetal force in the X direction is the normal force uh, equals mass, your mass, times the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, and you want that to replicate your speed, I'm sorry, your weight on Earth. So you want that normal force to be the same as your weight on Earth, which is just mg, your mass times the acceleration of gravity. And this allows us to actually calculate the um, speed. Now looking at this equation, the masses cancel, we solve for V in the same way we did before with the satellite problem, and we get the square root of GR for, um, for the speed. And so the speed you have to go is 130 meters per second. And um, if you want the period then, how, how many times you have to turn this guy, let's see, it looks like the radius is 1,700 meters. That's a pretty good size, um, pretty good size cylinder, 1.7 kilometers in size. And um, we can find the period by just taking 2 pi r over v. This you find from v is 2 pi r. I'm sorry. Well, no. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the fundamental concept. 
the very first fundamental concept derived the speed in uniform circular motion is the distance traveled, 2 pi r, divided by the time, which is the period, the time for one complete revolution. So I've just inverted this equation to find t. I've multiplied left and right sides by t. These t's cancel. And then I have um, divided both sides by v. These v's cancel, and we get t equals 2 pi r divided by v. So that's this equation here. Plug it in, and you get 82 seconds, about 1.4 minutes. So if you've got uh, a big cylinder that you're, circus, uh, that you're rotating to produce the simulated gravity, and it's 1,700 meters <coughs> in radius, then you need to spin that thing every 82 seconds. <coughs> Have one complete revolution every 82 seconds, or 1.4 minutes. <coughs>